Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's Score Fairfield County live webinar, Marketing the One-Person Business, Consulting, or Professional Business. There's a lot of interest in this topic, and um, I'm sure we're going to have a great webinar today. <clears throat> I'm Steve Smith, the webinar coordinator and a business mentor here at SCORE in Fairfield County. And today, joining me is Cliff Enico, an oftentimes uh, speaker and uh, general friend of SCORE. Um, the first time, as, as usual, I'm going to talk just for a minute or two about SCORE, and then I'm going to turn it over to Cliff. So some of you have heard this before, and so I apologize for the redundancy. But nonetheless, SCORE is a, uh, an organization, national organization, um, of about 320 different offices and over 11,000 volunteers. <clears throat> SCORE started in the mid-60s, that's the 1960s, uh, as a part of the Small Business Administration. Uh, locally, here in Fairfield County, we have um, uh, over 130 volunteers, uh, some of whom are actually still working and are volunteering their time in addition to that, and some are retired executives. Um, with de varying degrees of expertise in industry topics, uh, process topics like uh, supply chain, for example, subject matter experts, um, and, and uh, just about any practical uh, thing you'll, you would need to know about running a small, uh, a small business in Fairfield County. Um, some of you that are familiar with SCORE know that we really have three primary offerings. Uh, the workshop and webinar program, which is what you're in right now, uh, the webinar, uh, we do about 125 to 130 workshops per year, usually at um, local uh, libraries, but also other um, venues around Fairfield County. Uh, webinar program, uh, we're in our third, we're over three years now into the webinar program. And we do, we're on a track of doing two per month, usually the first and second Tuesdays uh, of the month, obviously. This is the first Tuesday of March. Uh, we also do a great deal of one-on-one -on -one counseling and mentoring. Oftentimes after people uh, attend one of our workshops or webinars, they'll uh, sign up for one-on-one -on -one counseling. You can do that, of course, through our work, work, through our website. In fact, to be honest, I should just mention now that anything that you're uh, at all curious about when it comes to SCORE, uh, just go to our, our website, uh, fairfieldcounty.score.org, and you'll see the entire uh, set of offerings, workshops, webinars, how to sign up for one-on-one -on -one counseling and, and mentoring. And you'll also find at that website a section of of a tremendous uh, reservoir of intellectual capital about how to start a small business, how to run a small business down to the process uh, process level. Uh, by the way, I just got some uh, statistics on this just this in the last week, but uh, over 30% of the webinar attendees sign up for one-on-one -on -one counseling. So again, you can do that right at our uh, right at our website. Um, now, <clears throat> excuse me. Our next uh, webinar is March 19th, and the subject will be social media advanced marketing strategies. And we've been doing uh, social media marketing um, webinars and workshops, you know, since it's been very hot and topical. And now I think people are getting so good at it that they're actually asking us to, you know, to, to break it down into different levels of classes. So this would be our, our first advanced uh, advanced uh, session. Our speaker will be Lorraine uh, Duncan, and uh, you've already gotten one email uh, inviting you to register for that, and you'll be getting uh, two more, the last one the day of the event. Also, I want, just can't overemphasize enough the uh, importance of our workshop series, Simple Steps. Uh, it's a five-workshop uh, series. Uh, the next one's going to start April 9th at the Fairfield uh, Library. You can see our website for details, but basically, you know, if you're in the business of running a small business or starting, or thinking of starting one, uh, this is this is the event for you. And again, at FairfieldCounty.Score.Or, you can find out all you need to know about it. Now, today, <clears throat> we're going to end sharply at one. Um, the webinar is being recorded. The webinar audio and slides will be available by the end of the day, noon tomorrow, by the latest at fairfieldcounty.score.org 
under on-demand webinars, on-demand webinars. Um, we've set aside time for Q&A at the end of Cliff's presentation. So if you have a, a question, you know, use the chat window in the lower left-hand corner. Enter your questions. I'll try to monitor it. We'll maybe answer some on the on the go before the end of the webinar uh, as um, as appropriate. You're also going to be receiving an email asking you to evaluate the quality of the webinar, and uh, we really uh, appreciate your input and we do use that information. Now, <clears throat> on to uh, Cliff Enico. Uh, Cliff's a, a, a frequent. Uh, speaker at our workshops and webinars. He's a nationally recognized small mis business legal and tax guru. He doesn't use that term, but I've decided to start calling him a guru. And he's uh, perhaps best known as a former host of Money Hunt, which was on PBS. And we can kind of think of it as um, the big first or the, the precursor to today what you would know as, uh, as Shark Tank. Uh, Cliff's an attorney and small business consultant. He's in Fairfield County, Connecticut, and he's helped launch over 15,000 businesses. He's written 16 books. He's recently written in uh, the Crowdfunding Handbook, and uh, or Crowdfunding Handbook: How to Raise Capital for Your Business Using Equity Funding Portals. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Cliff now. And again, just please post your questions in the chat room. And uh, we'll monitor those and try to get all of them by the end of uh, the next uh, next 55 or so minutes. Cliff, over to you. Hey, thanks, Steve. That was an absolutely wonderful introduction. I always says I'm a legend in my own mind, uh, and that absolutely confirms it. Uh, first of all, thanks to everybody. I see there's a lot of you guys today. Wow, um, you know who have decided to take uh, you know part of your time away. I mean, some of you are in snowy New England here. Some of you may be, you know, sitting on a on a uh, swimming pool, you know, down in Florida somewhere, you know, drinking a mai tai and doing this, um, you know. So thanks to all of you for taking uh, time out of whatever it is you're doing to listen to a lawyer teach you how to market. Um, that that takes a certain amount of I don't know what here, because uh, let's face it, when people think of professions that are marketing forward and all that, and lawyers don't exactly come to mind. I mean, our we have a little bit of an image issue here. Um, we obviously do not always do our marketing as well as we could, but this is a very personal program. Uh, for the last 20 years, I have been a – I'm going to teach you a new word here today. All of you on this call are what we call a solopreneur, a solopreneur. That is an entrepreneur who basically you know, works you know, on your own, maybe out of your house in your bathrobe and bunny slippers, like I do, and that's how I work too. Uh, for 23 years, I, I did work for a sequence of law firms back in the 80s and early 90s, but by – you know, 1994, I said, the heck with it. Uh, so now I am now selling, celebrating my 25th year as a solopreneur, you know, working out of my spare bedroom. And, you know, even though I call myself a lawyer and, I, you know, I do, I do use the L word, I try to keep it to an absolute minimum, really what I do is small business consulting. Uh, you know, I, so, I only work in the small business and entrepreneur space. I don't represent public companies or big companies uh, or companies that can afford to pay my bills. That's, that's, that's another story for another day. Uh, you know, I work with people like you, and that's why I went on my own was to to give a Wall Street quality of serv of legal service to you know people like yourself. That's that was that was my game plan from day one. I had to teach myself marketing. Uh, when I worked for big firms on Wall Street, I you know we had a marketing department uh, who would actually go out and market the firm and do all that stuff. And I, I never had to worry about it. All I had to do was get the work done and stay up all night and proofread all the documents at the printers and all the stuff that lawyers used to do back then. Um, you know, I was not supposed to worry about it. But that's a luxury you don't have when you work for yourself, and that's going to be really the theme of this whole program. So let's get started. Now you know I'm a lawyer. Uh, these are my, my usual disclaimers, of course. While I do, I've been doing score presentations now for uh, 38, 39 years now. It'll be 40 years next year. Uh, I started as soon as I got out of law school. Um, I am not, you know, technically I am not a score counselor. I am not in any legal way a part of the score organization. So anything that I say on this program is entirely me, nobody else. Um, and the second one is really the more important one here. There's a very big difference between uh, giving out legal and tax information and giving legal and tax advice. Uh, you know, there's a very big difference between saying, you know, here's what the law is all about, which we will get into some legal and tax stuff on this program. 
um, you know, this is what the law is all about. There's a very big difference between that and saying, here's what you should do, Joe and Mary, this is why you should do something different with the same situation. That's the kind of thing where, quite frankly, you're going to have to, I'm going to have to spend more time getting to know you a little bit. Uh, you really can't do that on a one-hour presentation. So, um, so just keep in mind, like I always say, you know, if, if anything I say here sounds like a good idea and you do it and it doesn't work out and you lose your business, your customers all disappear, you end up filing bankruptcy, uh, you know, your spouse divorces you, the kids don't want to talk to you anymore, your dog pees on your leg, and you end up living in a diaper box under the Brooklyn Bridge. You can't really sue anybody, okay? All right, so let's get that. Let's get out of the way. Marketing is the key to success in any small business or professional practice. I have I've been fortunate enough in my career. I have worked with conservatively somewhere between 25 and 30,000 people who have gone in some way the entrepreneurial path. And, and, in, and I would say that fully half of those people were in one-person businesses. And if there's one thing I've learned in working with these people, and if there's one thing I learned being running my own practice, um, is the key to success, you know, whole books have been written on how to succeed in business, but when you work for, your, for yourself, when you work as a solopreneur, it really boils down to how well you market yourself. If you market yourself well, if you do it well, if you do it digital, di di diligently and keep up with it, you will succeed sooner or later. I mean, it may take some sooner than it may be later rather than sooner, but sooner or later, you will survive. You will be able to to support yourself. You know, doing you know doing a, a consulting or, or other type of solo business. You will do it poorly, and you will fail. It's an almost a hundred percent guarantee. If you don't do it well, if you don't keep it up, sooner or later, the phone stops ringing, the emails stop coming in. Um, and, and sooner or later, you'll be finding yourself looking to do something else with your life. This is a rule of thumb. This is, you know, this is just my rule of thumb that I that I live by. You sh when you're running a solo business, you should spend at least 20 to 25 percent of your total business time on marketing activities. Maybe a little more when you're starting out. Maybe 30, 35 percent. One hour out of every three. Um, one of the biggest mistakes and probably the biggest mistake that solopreneurs like us make, and I see it on a daily basis in my law practice, is you get so busy with the project of the moment or the client of the moment that you let your marketing slide. And that's a very, very bad idea. Because sooner or because when you're in, in business for yourself, and especially if you're doing any kind of consulting work or any kind of information uh, business, um, the key to success is having a pipeline of business. You know, when I do these webinar, webinars, I, I don't always get calls from people the very next day saying, hey, Cliff, you were fantastic. Listen, have a, here's a problem I have. How, how much is it going to cost to get it solved? I mean, it does happen every once in a while, but it doesn't happen as often as you might think. But here's the kind of call that I get just about every day. Hey, Cliff, we haven't spoken in a while. Uh, you did something for me like eight, nine years ago. Uh, listen, something's going on right now. I have a new thing I'm working on. Can you help me? Are you still in the business? Can you help us me, me, me out with this? When I'm talking to you, I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking to all the people that you know in your network. You know, many of you have never dealt with a small business attorney before. Maybe many of you don't even know a small business attorney, but now you know at least one. You know, and that's the most important thing. You've got to keep throwing bread on the water is what I talk about here. You know, sometimes the ducks, the fish go for it. Sometimes they don't. But you've got to keep doing it. It's when you stop doing it that sooner or later – the phones don't ring for a day or two, or the emails stop coming in, and that's when life gets very, very nerve-wracking. You know, when you're when you're working on your own. I mean, I, I, I talk about this in other programs too that I've done for Score. One of the hardest parts of, of being a solopreneur is dealing with the loneliness factor of this. And, and let me tell you, when you're working out of your home in your spare bedroom and that phone hasn't rung for a couple of days, you start getting scared. You start getting nervous. You want to try to avoid being in that situation as much as possible. Um, you know, never get so caught up keeping your current clients happy that you ignore your marketing. Spend at least an hour every day doing marketing-related stuff, the stuff we're going to talk about later in the program. Last but not least, I want to just sort of looking at the big picture, your marketing program needs to be results-based. You should be spending your time and money only on marketing channels that actually work, that drive customers and referral sources to your doorstep. There are a lot of things in the marketing world that are fun to do, 
but they're not productive. They don't generate business. I mean, they make you happy. Um, you know, they're fun to do. You know, maybe you know, uh, blogging or something like that on some esoteric topic or something. It might be a fun thing to do. You know, but if it's not driving business to business to your doorstep, it's something you shouldn't be wasting your time doing. Time is limited. Uh, I'm 64 years old right now. I'm going to be 65 next month. And let me tell you something. I'm becoming aware. Time is more precious than money. You only get so much of it in life, and especially when you're trying to build a solo business. You don't want to be spending your time uh, doing things that are not productive, that do not get you results. We'll talk more about that in detail as we get on in the program. Okay. Before you can understand how to market, you've got to understand a little bit about why customers buy. And this is probably the most powerful thing I have learned in the you know, 38 years that I've been practicing law and in the 20, you know, 25 years that I've been on, of those years that I've been on my own. Um, you know, there are only two reasons why anybody buys anything in this world. And if you come from a business background, if you've taken some business courses or maybe you have an MBA, you've been told that it's all about needs and wants. As people either need something or people want something. And, and, and i got to burst the bubble here. Um, it's not true. Needs and wants do not motivate uh, client behavior. Uh, the, there are two reasons why anybody buys anything, but they're not needs and wants. They're fears and passions. Okay, appealing to people's needs, and this is a big problem. When people start a marketing program, they say, well, okay, people buy things because of their needs and wants. I need to cater to that. No. When you cater to, to people's needs, you learn a very hard and very negative lesson. It doesn't work. Uh, there are, there are, uh, before you can buy something you need, you, you have to go through two steps intellectually, and most people don't do it uh, in the real world. It only happens in textbooks. Um, in order to buy something you need, you have to, first of all, persuade them that they need it. Um, you know, uh, so let's say that I reach into my magic suitcase here and I come out with this ugly machine. It, it looks like a football. It's got all kinds of funny wires. It's made out of some metal that looks like titanium. It's got all kinds of lights flashing. And I put this thing and I say to you folks, listen, this is my new thing. It's called the frugal framus. Those of you, uh, that's a made up word, by the way. I use it like many people use widget. Uh, it doesn't really mean anything. Um, Here's my newest invention. I call it the frugal framus. But this, you know, in your office, it'll make your marketing so much easier. You'll be able to find the customers. You'll be able to know exactly who's there, who's not, who does, who has the money, who doesn't. You know, this is all great stuff. But meanwhile, you're kind of looking at me like, you know, cross-eyed. You know, Cliff, forgive me. This thing just—I don't get this. I mean, this thing looks kind of like a bomb. I mean, are you like Al Qaeda? Are you ISIS? I mean, what's going on? I mean, this, I, I just don't get this. You know, you're you're a little. You're a little nervous about this, you know, and I said, I gotta, what I got to do is I got to calm you down. I got to talk about the benefits, the features, how it does what it does. And eventually, sooner or later, maybe you get to a point where you say, well, okay, Cliff, I didn't buy it at first, but now I kind of get it. You're right. I really do need this thing. How long is that going to take? How long is it going is it going to take for me to get you to buy into something like this, something you've never seen before that's kind of new, it's kind of different? Well, let me tell you something. Um, the, here's, a, here's a little trivia question if you want to have some fun at some cocktail parties. You know, a lot of people think the first personal computers came out sometime in the mid-1980s, sometime like 84, 85 or something, but do a little research. Go look at your history. The very first personal computer, the, the Apple II, the first commercial first PC, was issued in 19... Out on the market in 1976. Uh, it was Apple, uh, Apple's first PC product. So think about this. Now, and think back, if you're older especially, when did you buy your first PC? You know, the answer is probably, if you're older, if you're a baby boomer or maybe you know, older Gen X, you bought it sometime in the mid-'80s, 1984, 1985. But those things were around for 10 years before you bought it. For 10 years, the early you know, PC companies that got into the PC market, back then it was Apple, IBM, Hewlett Packard, uh, all these companies, they were screaming at you for 10 years, hey, your, high, your life's going to be wonderful if you have a computer in your home, in your family room, in your den, whatever, your man cave. Uh, you know, life's going to be wonderful, you know, but you weren't listening. You said, well, computers, they're big, they're ugly, they're problematic, they always break down, they're expensive, they're hot, they generate lots of heat. There were all kinds of reasons why you didn't buy in. It took them 10 years and hundreds of millions of dollars of ad money to get you to the point where you say, okay, you got it, we got this, you know, we, you're right, Microsoft, we probably do need a computer in our house, and thanks for creating Windows uh, or DOS, you know, back then, um, you know. So some people just don't get over that hurdle. But here's the trick. Even if they know they need something, even if 
they know. If, even if I come out of my uh, – I, I pull something out of my suitcase and you say, okay, Cliff, yep, you're right, I need it. Do they buy right away? Do they buy right now? The answer is hardly ever. I won't say never, uh, but like Gilbert and Sullivan, I would say hardly ever. Um, they ever do. And I'll give you an example just to show you that I'm no better than anybody else when it comes to this stuff. Uh, I'm a lawyer, okay? It took me over 30 years to have a will done for me. Now, that, should, that might shock some of you, okay? It took me 30 years, you know, of, before I actually sat down with a lawyer and had somebody draft a will for me and my wife and my family. Now, you say to yourself, well, wait a minute, you know, that's, that's weird. What, what, you know, you're, a, you're, you're a lawyer, you know. I mean, let me ask you, I mean, why did I wait so long? Why was I putting it off, putting it off? I mean, is it because I don't know I need one? Well, heck, you know, hell's bells. I mean, I'm a lawyer. If anybody knows they need a will, it's me. And I'll, and I'll make, it, make it even worse um, because I myself don't do wills. I don't do estate planning or any of that kind of stuff, what they call wills and trusts. I don't do any of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, when someone asks me to, for help in doing a will, I refer them to other attorneys that I know who practice in that area. And they're all wonderful people. They say, hey, Cliff, thanks for sending me Joe Blow. He's a great client. Listen, uh, when it comes time for you and your wife to do your will, call me. I'll do it free of charge. I'll do it as a professional courtesy. This is how we say thank you. We're not allowed to take referral fees. So this is how we thank each other for referrals in my business. Um, so, th so think about that for a second. Here I am. I'm a relatively intelligent human being. I know I need something, and I got people offering to pay Pay, not pay, people offering to do it for me for free, and I'm still resisting. I'm still saying no. Why? Because Let me tell you, it's, this is not just about me. This is about your customer. If you don't have any other way of getting through to them, if you're just selling things because they need them, it's logical. You use your left brain. You're like Mr. Spock on the old Star Trek series. Well, it's logical that we do it this way. It's not going to happen for you. People buy things for one of two basic reasons. Either the product or service turns them on in some way. It gets them excited in some way. That's the passion sell. Uh, or the product service or service helps them sleep better at nights. Think about it. Think about whole industries that are based on, on passion-based products. And here's a trick. If you, uh, if you can't think about passions, think of the seven deadly sins. You know, pride, lust, greed, envy. These are all... Um, they may or may not be sinful. I'm not going into that. This is not a, a Sunday school program or any kind of religious thing that I'm doing here. But these are seven very common passions that most people have. And whole businesses have been based on each one of the seven deadly sins. Pride, feeling better about yourself uh, as a professional, as a person, whatever. Anything to do with self-improvement uh, is, is an appeal to people's pride. Lust, <laughs> come on, sex sells. Uh, we all know that. Look at any perfume ad on television. It's not about you know, what the stuff smells like. It's about, you know, sex. Uh, you know, greed, Wall Street, you know, I got this wonderful new mutual fund that will give you a 15% return on investment no matter what the market is doing or maybe, you know, that kind of thing. You know, pride, like, you, you can think of businesses that key into any one of the seven deadly sins. Or the product helps them sleep better at night. So if you've got a product or service that relieves people anxi anxieties and makes them fear less about things, you have a, a very successful solo consulting business coming. Uh, insurance, you know, all insurance is based on, on this. Uh, you know, you don't sell insurance because of passion. You sell insurance because people are worried about dying and their families starving. And that's why that's how life insurance salesmen work. They scare the garbage out of you. Home security systems. How about lawyers, people? You know, I'm in, I'm in a fear business. You know, when was the last time you called your lawyer when you were having a nice day? It doesn't happen. There are two people you don't call when you're having a nice day, your lawyer and your orthopedic surgeon. Okay, <laughs> seriously, when you're calling these people, something really bad is happening to you. Um, you know, seriously. Uh, you know, so you have to kind of know, are you in a fear business or are you in a passion business? Because that's how you're going to market your business. You know, are you catering to people's passions or are you catering to people's fears? If you're not sure which one is going to work better, maybe you don't know your customers as well as you should, and that you should spend some time and maybe a little bit of money finding out what their fears and passions really are before you start pitching yourself to them. And now, now some of you may be resisting this a little bit. You may be saying, well, wait a minute, Cliff. I mean, at some level, we all need food. You know, if you don't eat, you know, every day, sooner or later you starve. You know, uh, you, 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 you dry up, you shrivel away. Uh, so a problem that I really need to have, actually, in my life. I'm quite, I go quite the other direction, but let's not go, let's not go there. That's, that's getting a little too personal here. Yes, at some level we all need food, but whether you satisfy your hunger with a steamed broccoli platter or a broccoli platter, I can't say that, or a quarter pounder burger, whether you, which way you go is all driven by your fears and passions. 
sooner or later, um, you're going to realize that fears and passions are the only two reasons that drive people to buy anything. Now you say, well, what about businesses? Okay, B to, I'm selling B2B. This is all great for consumer selling, but what about business selling? You know, businesses don't have fears and passions. You're right about that, but business executives do. And ultimately, when you sell B2B, you're not selling to the companies. You're selling to the people. Uh, and people do have fears and passions. If I work, if I'm a senior executive of a big company, and I'm thinking of hiring you as a consultant or to be a presenter or like me, uh, we're having our annual meeting. We want Cliff Enico to come in and entertain the troops, you know, with a with a with a with a comical speech, you know. You're worried that if I really blow it, you're going to lose your job. You're going to look like an idiot. You're going to be embarrassed, and you might possibly lose your job and end up being unemployed. So it's not really accurate to say that businesses don't have fears. People, corporate executives do. What I've just done in the last five minutes, I apologize. I know we spent a little, lot of time on this one slide, but it's really the most important slide in the whole presentation. I've actually done a whole – I have a whole hour-long talk on this. Um, I have a YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube.com and you search for Cliff Enico, you can't do the, the, the forward slash thing with me. You have to actually search the, uh, on YouTube for Cliff Enico. I always go by Cliff. You'll see that I have a video with about a quarter of a million views right now called How to Sell Just About Anything to Just About Anybody. And there's the link uh, on this, you know, just in case. But really, if you just go to YouTube.com and you can either search for Cliff Enico or How to Sell, I guarantee uh, you will get to my video. I'm wearing this absolutely ugly purple sweater. I saw Sort of look like Barney uh, a little bit, um, so you, you, I guarantee you'll be able to tell which one's the right one. Uh, and take take an hour out of your life and listen to this. It's a score presentation that I did in 2015, uh, and a quarter of a million people in just about every country on the globe have said that this has changed their lives. So you could, you are welcome to join them, and it's absolutely free, by the way. I don't charge for this. You won't get clobbered with ads or anything like that. Okay, let's move on here. Um, what are your clients or customers? What are they looking for? Okay, I mean, let's face it, your, your personality is important. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But there are really, if you're in a service business, if you're in a consulting business like I am, there are only three things that, client, that customers care about. Can you solve my problem? You know, do you have what it takes? Can you ask whatever this problem is if it's a fear cell? Or can you give me what I want if it's a passion cell? Can you get me, can you get me high um, you know, if you're in more of a passion business? You make me feel, you know, better about the world and everything like that. That's number one. Number two, can I work with you? Can we communicate well? Are you going to look down your nose at me, uh, you know, because you hear I have a problem? And then three, can I afford your services? These are the three questions that, I mean, there may be others as well, but these are the three questions I guarantee are on your customers' minds. And your marketing program needs to cater to each one of these three things. If you look at my website at cliffenico.com, I have several websites, but that's the one from my law practice. You will see that all I talk about are here are the things I do, these are the problems I solve, um, you know, and here's my fee schedule. I actually put my fee schedule up on my website, uh, which a lot of lawyers don't do. Uh, and they're absolutely stupid for not doing that because people do care. People are afraid to ask about legal fees. Uh, they're afraid of that. I, 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 I open with that. I, t I, put my, I put it right out there. Here's how much it's going to charge. You want me to you want to buy a franchise? Here's how much it's going to cost. You want to form an LLC? Here's how much it's going to cost. Your personality and your ability to empathize with a client's situation are your two biggest marketing tools. I will say this at least three times during this program. People, when you're, when you're a solopreneur in a service business, people do not buy your services, they buy you. You are a part of the package. When I did, when I did my website at cliffenico.com, I got to the end of, my, of the home page, and I really didn't know how to end it. I wanted to do a call to action saying, hey, you know, call me, send me an email, whatever. So and I didn't really know how to do it the right way, so I just wrote, I just wrote down, and it's still up there. Um, still have questions, call me, dot, 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 I don't bite. I cannot tell you how many times people have called me and said, hey, Cliff, I read your website. The minute I saw that you say you don't bite, I knew I want to work with you. You know, because lawyers don't do that. We don't humanize ourselves. We don't come down to people's level and say, hey, I'm just a regular guy or a person like you. You know, we don't do that. You know, call me. I'm not going to jump down your throat. You have a problem. The IRS is coming after you. Great. That's what I do. I help people with those kind of problems. Terrific. Let's start working together. Let's get it solved. You got a problem? Terrific. Don't worry about it. You know, you're probably not going to go to jail. You're okay. You're, you're going to be, you're going to survive this. You know, I see this all the time. I know how to handle it. That's going to put you a lot at, le at ease and alleviate your fears. You know, uh, that's what you want to do. You've got to be a human being and deal with people on a human level. Make sure your marketing communications tell people 
that's what you do. Don't overlook your ethnic background, your sex, and other personal characteristics, your religion. Um, you know, we're, we're living in a world that's getting increasingly diverse and inclusive, and I'm not saying that anything against that, but it's still the case that most people feel comfortable working with people who they perceive as being like them. Uh, I happen to have an Italian American last name. Uh, it ends with the it ends with a vowel, as most of them do. Uh, I will confess to you, I am not really Italian American in my culture. I wasn't brought up that way. Um, you know, I, I there's a lot of things Italian Amer most Italian Americans know that I don't know. But I will tell you, I get a lot of calls from people who have vowels at the end of their name, so I don't disabuse them of that. You know, when when, when they when they call me, I'm a paisan. And that's how I, you know, I want them to perceive me because they'll feel a little bit more comfortable that way. You know, I get a lot of calls from people with vows at the end of their names. And hey, you know, it, you, you will find that that will be true of you as well. So don't be don't be afraid to take advantage of that. Um, you know, if you are a member of a minor, of a minority group, or if you are a female, or if you're whatever, let that be a part of the marketing message too. Hey, you know, I'm like you. I I I I, I can relate. I feel your pain. Whatever it is. Okay, uh, there are three levels of marketing communication now. Now that we've done some of sort of the big picture of, of you know, uh, I call it the zen of what your marketing, um, uh, your marketing message should be. Now let's start talking about more practical stuff here. There are three basic levels of marketing communication. I call the uh, level one, level two, level three. Level one I call recognition marketing. This is not marketing that's targeted. It's just reminding people you're still there. In the words of that guy on Spamalot, the Spamalot Broadway musical, I'm not dead yet. Okay, um, you, you want to be doing things on a regular basis to let your existing or former clients or customers know, hey, Cliff Enico's at, wait a minute, Cliff Enico, yeah, oh, God, I worked with him years ago. I heard him talking score years ago. Yeah, he, he knows about this stuff. Yeah, I got this problem. I, I should call this guy. You know, yeah, he's the perfect guy for this. That's, that's what you want people to do. It's also getting your name in people's heads. Um, I used to work years ago with a financial advisor who used to take a an ad out, a quarter page ad in the local newspaper. This is back in the 80s and 90s, and every week her you know photo was all there. It was reliable. She had a little you know a little one paragraph thing of financial advice. And I asked her, I said, you know, why do you do that? You know, people just don't look at an ad and say, well, I'm going to hire her because I'm a financial because you're a financial advisor. And she said, hey, you're right about that, Cliff. But let me tell you what happens all the time when I meet people at a cocktail party or someplace where I'm speaking. They say, wait a minute, you're that one that advertises in the in the citizen right the local paper yeah that's i see you i remember i recognize you from your photo that's what you're doing it's it's recognition people know that you're out there when people see that you advertise in a newspaper every week they know well, she's obviously in this business you know she is somebody who's serious that's why she's in the paper every week uh so advertising email blasts billboards if your business lends itself to that mini ads on tv radio here's a dirty little secret uh if you have cable if you have a cable TV station in your area, wherever you are, there is a station, it's usually somewhere in the 60s, that does nothing but um, weather and, uh, and weather and traffic, and that's all it is. You know, they do, you know, five minutes of, of weather, then there's a break, and then they have uh, five minutes of traffic, and then it goes back. It's a loop. The same video plays over and over again until they change it two or three times a day. Those ads that run in between the segments when they're going from weather to traffic, traffic to weather, a lot of them are only five-second ads, and they're very affordable. Uh, you can do this. You know, a five-second ad for your business, uh, you know, Let's face it, if I'm tuning in to, the, to this channel and I want the weather but the traffic's on, I've got to sit and wait and look at those commercials before the weather forecast comes on. I'm, I'm a captive audience for you. Don't, don't overlook those. Level two is explanation marketing. You know, your story. Uh, telling people the fears and passions you deal with, how you make people's lives better. This is where your brochures, your website, your LinkedIn uh, profile, your online reviews, uh, Yelp and some other places. There's one for attorneys called AVO, A-V-V-O. This is where those things come in. And then last but not least, this is solicitation marketing. This is one-on-one -on -one stuff. Sale meetings, coupons, the call to action that will get people to contact you, get in your face, and hopefully buy something. Okay. So let's talk about the four fillers of a marketing program. This is how solo entrepreneurs market, how most of them do. This is, how, this is what I do. Uh, number one, your involvement in organizations and community activities. Number two, your personal interaction with clients uh, and referral sources, what we call your elevator pitch. Your public speaking strategy. 
uh, and your website and social media pages. These are the four pillars of a solopreneur marketing program. Uh, what you are trying to do here is you are trying to – what you're trying to do is you're trying to fill in the boxes on a piece of graph paper. Let's play a little game right now. Uh, I want you all to visualize in your mind a sheet of graph paper. We put a bunch of squares on it, okay? Um, okay. Uh, what I want you to do is, in your mind's eye, I want you to put X's in those boxes, but don't do it in any particular order. Do it in a random sequence, okay? Now let's pretend that lightning is striking this piece of graph paper, and like and like you, it's not striking the paper in any kind of order. It's striking boxes uh, on your sheet of graph paper in random sequence. It doesn't take much genius or math ability to know that if you only have a few X's in a few boxes, the odds of lightning striking one of those X bo boxes marked that you've marked with an X is relatively slim to none. But as you fill in more or more boxes in, on that sheet of graph paper, it soon, become, it soon becomes almost inevitable and almost a certainty that lightning will strike a box that you have an X in. This is what your marketing strategy is all about. Whenever you meet someone, you make a contact, you get you, your, your name in somebody's head, that is an X on the sheet of graph paper. And the more X's you have, the more likely it is that when opportunities strike, someone is going to remember you. Uh, I got a call last week that, that summarizes this all up in a single sentence. I got a call from somebody who said, hey, Cliff, uh, I'm looking to do X, Y, and Z here, and I think I have to hire you as my attorney. And I said, no, nah, you don't have to hire me. You've you, you got a million attorneys around. You don't, you don't have to hire any particular one. I got lots of competition. He goes, no, I think I have to hire you, Cliff, because when I, when I started looking for an attorney, I called three people that I know don't know each other, and all three of them said, you are the attorney I should contact. That's where you want to be with your marketing thing. That guy called all three, three exes that didn't know each other, and all three of them, I had exes in those boxes, and that's why I got the call. We call this ubiquity, being everywhere. So let's, let's go through the four real quickly, and then we'll, we'll break for questions. This is, this is the easy part of the program. Uh, your organizations and your community activities. Profe forget professional associations and networking groups. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I do participate in some bar association activities because I need to have like education credits and things like that. But I have to tell you, I don't get a lot of of business from bar associations. Lawyers tend not to refer business to other lawyers, uh, you know, very often. Um, where I want to be, the groups that I want to join are groups that have the greatest number of potential clients and referral sources and the fewest number of competitors. Uh, when I first started practicing on my own, uh, I was doing a lot of computer law work. Um, there was an organization up here called the Northeast Software Association. This was an organization of mom-and-pop software developers that were developing niche software products out of their home, mostly from Microsoft Windows. This was the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, they invited me to speak to their lunch meeting. Uh, I said yes, and when I did, there was 100 people in that room. Uh, and I was the only software lawyer that they had ever known or ever met. I mean, it was one of the greatest marketing coups of my life. I had 30 clients in that one – That I, I got 30 clients out of that one speaking engagement. Um, you know, because, you know, they, they were all software developers. They were all people I could help, and there were no other lawyers in the room. What is a flake ratio? This is a Cliff Enico thing. I think I'm the only person in the world who talks about this. Um, the flake ratio, when it comes to an organization – uh, every organization has a flake ratio, and it is the ratio of flaky people to total population. That is the, that is the flake ratio. Uh, whenever you're dealing with an organization, you're going to find that there are some flaky people there, but you, don't, you, you want to be involved in organizations where the ratio is extremely low, where 95% of the people that are in that organization are people who would be potential clients or referral sources, people that you must take seriously and who will take you seriously. If you're in organizations that have very high flake rate, well, flakes are very amusing people, uh, but you don't want to be in an organization where you have to waste time. Flakes have a nasty tendency to become time vampires uh, in, my, in my profession. You want to keep those people as, as little in your life as possible. Uh, believe in the organization's mission. Don't join an organization for the cynical purpose of getting business only. People will see right through that. I mean, don't, if you're not religious, do not go on a church 
board of trustees and, or a synagogue board of trustees uh, or a mosque board of trustees. Don't do that unless you are committed to the religion and, and to the and to the mission. Uh, be prepared to roll up your sleeves and get involved. Um, organizations, especially charities, can be time vampires, but you can get business out of them. Never pass up a photo opportunity. Whenever your charity gets in the news, make sure you're one of the people standing there smiling with one of your hands on the check that they're that they're giving to somebody. Okay, that's organizations. Now let's talk about personal contact and network. Don't I, I, do, I, I talk at a lot of networking agreements and uh, networking groups, and I tell you, I always cringe when I do them because inevitably, no sooner do I walk in the room than somebody comes right up to me, sticks his card in my face. It's always a guy. It's never a lady. And he says, hi, I'm Joe Blow. I sell life insurance. Well, you know what? I'll tell you something about that. I mean, I've been practicing law for 38 years, 25 of those years on my loan. You know, I kind of know a few life insurance salespeople. I don't need any new people in my network that do that kind of work. And I'll tell you something else. When most people are looking to start a business, the last thing in their mind is starting li- is, is looking for life insurance. What they want is liability insurance. You know, what happens if I get sued? Am I going to lose my house? That's the thing. Do you do any liability coverage? If you do, I got business for you. Uh, well, gee, I only do li- I only write life and disability. I will tell you something. Get yourself a license for liability coverage. Number one, if you do, I got business for you. And number two, you're going to find that when that when somebody does liability insurance and you provide them with that coverage, then the next question is, well, listen, I need life and disability, and now you can write those policies to those people. Li- people when people are looking to start businesses, they want liability coverage, malpractice insurance. That's errors and omissions. That's what they're looking for. You know, so forgive me, I can't help you. You know, don't talk about what you do. Talk about the people that you work with. How do you solve their problems? What are their fears and passions? Focus on that. Remember, these are the only two reasons that people buy anything at all. Get them talking about their fears and passions. Um, you know, because people, and the, by the way, this is easy to do. People love to talk about their fears and passions. We spend 90% of our time when we meet, when we interact with people talking about the things that turn us on and the things that we worry about these these two topics account for 90% of our total conversations that we have with people get them talking about that when you're doing an elevator pitch at a group meeting don't talk about yourself don't go up there and say i'm a small business or lawyer the minute i utter the l word the temperature in the room drops 10 degrees people have very strong opinions about lawyers most of them negative uh, i don't want to lead with that you know, I tell people, look, here's the kind of people I work with. Here's a story about somebody who had a problem. Here's how I help them. You know, tell them how you make people's lives better. What fears and passions do you deal with? Um, let them know what distinguishes you from your competition. That's another thing, too. Uh, I work with small businesses. I don't work with big businesses. I don't do wills. I don't do, you know, a lot of the usual small business stuff. I'm really focused on working with entrepreneurs that are looking to build successful businesses. And then tell a story a humorous anecdote or a weird fact that will stick in the person's head and make them remember you weeks and months from today. People remember stories. They don't always remember details, factual details, but they do remember stories. So, for example, uh, back in the 90s, I ran a little publishing company called Bayan Express. Here is the, um, the, um, uh, the elevator pitch that I used for that company. Uh, hi, I'm Cliff Enico, president of Bayan Express. Um, we are a publisher of books, audio tapes, and seminars designed to help lawyers um, manage their careers better. Uh, we don't try to make them better lawyers. We try to make them more successful at building their professional practices. Uh, one of our books, uh, The Legal Job Interview by Cliff Enico, one of my very first books, uh, was the book most frequently stolen from law libraries around the country, according to a recent law librarian survey. And that's an absolutely true statement, by the way. I wrote a book in the early 90s called The Legal Job Interview that for two years running was the book most frequently stolen from law libraries around the United States, according to the American Law Librarians Association. Now, that doesn't say much about the ethics of my profession, ladies and gentlemen, but let me tell you, it's great dust jacket copy, uh, right? I mean, how bad can a book be if people are stealing them, right? Now, of course, what I wasn't telling them is that whenever I visited uh, a law school to give a talk, you know, for Bayan Express, I always made a point of visiting the library. No, I, I never stole books. I never, I never, ever did that. Okay, there we go. All right, so that's personal contact. 
Your public speaking strategy, very important. If you are an information professional, if your, prof if your profession involves giving advice to people of any kind, you got to get out there and let people see you. Remember I said before, it's not about what you do, it's about who you are. Get in people's faces. It's probably the best and most successful ways to market a one-person business. When I first started out practicing um, here in Connecticut, 25 years ago, there was a publication called the Fairfield County Business Journal. In fact, it still exists. It's a weekly newspaper on business stuff. And there was a column in the back called On the Agenda. And this was a list of every organization that was meeting that month, that week. Um, you know, and they gave the name and the telephone number of the program director. So what I would do is I simply picked up the phone, I called him up, and I said, hey, I just uh, look at the business journal here. I see that you, you're the National Association of some kind of accountant or whatever. I see you have regular meetings. Listen, I'm a, a new lawyer in town here. Uh, here are some of the topics I speak about. I think I got some stuff that, I, that, I, that your members are really interested in, and I'm free. Uh, I don't charge for this. Just feed me. I'm yours. Okay? Whenever you utter the F word, free, you will get a call back. It's an almost guarantee. These are people who belong to this organization. It's not what they do for a living. They're, list, they're looking for good speakers all the time, and here you are calling out of the blue and offering, offering to speak for nothing. You are making their life very easy. You, know, you will get callbacks. Okay? And then when you get a gig, you spend time, you put together your program, your PowerPoint, whatever. Remember always when you're speaking, you are in show business. Uh, the most valuable lesson I ever learned about public speaking came from an old, grizzled old lawyer in Brooklyn. Uh, I was going out to give my first talk for a bar association, as it turned out. And I'll never forget, he said, if you can't keep them awake, Cliff, you can't teach them nothing. If you, can't, if you can't get people to listen to you, be a little entertaining. Use humor if you can or dramatic stories. Make them laugh. Make them cry. You know, uh, this is Hollywood, baby. Um, and remember always to include the disclaimer, this is information, not advice, just like I did at the very beginning of this program. One last thing, by the way, uh, be sure to hit the gym regularly as you will gain lots of weight doing this. When I first started marketing my practice, I was speaking at about 15 lunches a month. And I gained about 10 pounds in 30 days, so just be careful about that. Make sure you hit the gym. Uh, watch your health. Last but not least, uh, your website and social media. You, the answer is, Cliff, you, you, wait a minute. We're living in 2019. Why are you talking about websites in 2019? Answer, you need a website. If you're, if you're doing any kind of a service business, you need a website of your own. If I see that your name is Cliff Enico and you're not CliffEnico.com, that's an instant buzzkill for me. Uh, I don't take you seriously. Um, take a look at my CliffEnico.com site. I follow my own advice here. What should be on your website? A description of what you do in layperson's terms. Don't say you're a small business lawyer because people don't know what a small business lawyer does. Say, I help people draft contracts. I help people resolve business disputes. I write nasty collection letters. Uh, I buy and sell, help people buy and sell their businesses. You know, talk in terms of what you do, not what you are. Okay, no one cares about your identity. They do care about what you do for people. Um, you know, how much you charge. Always put your fees out there. Uh, free information content. Don't just tell people how smart you are. Don't tell them about your degree from Dartmouth or Harvard or wherever you went to school. Show them how, give them some free information. Help them, give them some free advice for something. Show them how smart you are. And then always testimonials or endorsements from satisfied clients. Of course, I'm going to say that I'm great on my website. But I want you to see, too, what my clients are saying about me or on, the web, or on the review sites like Yelp or something like that. What shouldn't be on your website, your photo, unless it is professionally done and you're relatively good looking. Let's be very honest about this. If you have a face that frightens small children, uh, do not put your photo up there. Or unless you are trying to establish that you are a member of a certain ethnic community, that might be important as well that people see that, that you are a member of that community. Uh, that's another thing. But have it professionally done, and make sure you present yourself in the best possible light. Uh, most lawyers that I deal with, frankly, should never have their photos on their website unless it is totally professionally done. Um, your biography, nobody really cares where you went to school or what your degrees were. No one cares about professional awards or articles. I mean, half the lawyers in the United States are listed in one of the best lawyers directories, so that kind of takes away from some of it. Uh, I'll tell you right now that you get into those directories by paying to get into them. That's how it works. It's like the old who's who uh, books. You know, if you're a lawyer, you got a license, chances are you can get into one of the best lawyers' directories, even though your clients all hate you and you're stupid. Um, you know, so don't, so don't be, the, the, no one's going to be impressed by that. There should only be things on your website and your social media that people care about. Okay. 
Um, marketing the home-based business, uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm kind of running out of time here, so uh, I'll just share with you that another one, I have another YouTube video. It's uh, another whole hour on how to work out of a home, uh, out, of, out of your home. Um, if, if you go, again, if you go to YouTube.com, if you search for Cliff Enico, you'll see I have 35 one-hour videos up there. Uh, and this is another program. I also do it very frequently for SCORE, um, is, you know, how to build a successful home-based business. One big thing I'm a big believer with is don't use your home address for business purposes. You know, if your address is 123 Daffodil Lane and you're a lawyer, that's not exactly the image you want to project to people. Uh, uh, there are, uh, uh, many of you know there are places called UPS stores. It's where you send stuff via UPS. You can also rent a private mailbox there. Uh, it's a P.O. box, just like you get at the post office, but instead of being P.O. box 123, you have a street address. You're 123 Main Street, suite number 456, or number 456. Use that address. Uh, that's a commercial location. You don't have to worry about zoning or anything like that if you work out of your home. And also, it will also get you out of the house at least twice a day. Remember what I said, loneliness is a big issue when you're working uh, a home, uh, as a solopreneur and especially when you work out of your home. Marketing on the Internet, I mean, we talked about number four websites. Always remember, when you market on the Internet, it's not about uh, – it's all about pulling the customer to you. You cannot met push your message into people's faces. If you try to push your message into people's faces, they've got all kinds of defenses up. There's spam filters. There are pop-up blockers. They can make sure your message doesn't get through to them. What you have to do is seduce them a little bit. Get them interested in you enough that they'll come looking for you and find your website, your Facebook page, your LinkedIn profile, whatever it is. The customer is in control when they're on the web. They have to come to you. And these are the four things that people look for online, cool, compelling, content, free advice, stuff that's hard to find elsewhere, rare antiques and stuff like that. Great deals on stuff that's easy to find elsewhere, like-minded people. Um, the best online, and keep in mind that even in 2019, the best online marketing often is offline. How many of you have checked out a website on the web because you saw an article in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or some of the newspaper saying, uh, you know, profiling this great new business in town that sells cookies and whatever, and here's their website? Don't ignore your offline marketing. We are gradually moving to a digital world, but we still have some way to go before we're there. Okay, marketing ethics in the law, obviously if you are a professional lawyer or accountant, there are rules of conduct you must comply with when marketing. Uh, we lawyers have a very strict rule against uh, ambulance chasing, and we have to be very, very careful how we uh, comply with that. And even if you're not, there are some basic ethical and legal rules. I mean, the Federal Trade Commission in Washington uh, regulates false uh, and misleading advertising. Don't overpromise. Don't bait and switch. By all means, seek positive reviews, but don't pay for them. There's an FTC rule says that if I'm paying you something to give me a positive review online and Yelp or something, that has to be disclosed as part of the endorsement. If you search online for FTC testimonial guidelines, in quotes, you will see uh, the FTC has actually a 10-page set of rules about what you can and cannot do uh, when asking people to endorse you online. So these are the key points here. My bottom line on marketing, do it ethically, do it professionally, but do it every day. Every day. Do not let your marketing slide. If you've gone a couple of days without doing any marketing activity, stop whatever it is you're doing and spend an hour updating your Facebook page, updating your website, doing whatever you can so that you're remaining fresh and remaining in people's minds and in people's memories. So here's what I look like. This, here's the exact reason why many lawyers should never use their photo as part of their advertising program. Who would ever hire this guy? Um, but that's only because I don't really know how to crop a photo. I'm actually not as fat as that. I, I, I don't know how to crop a photo. I, I have to learn a little bit more about Photoshop, I think. So without any further ado, Steve, uh, let me throw the ball back in, in, in your court here, and let's take some questions. Hey, Cliff. <clears throat> perfect, great, perfect timing and uh, great content. We have some some good questions here. I'm gonna first thing I'm gonna do here is we did have a question early on before you got into the pillars, which uh, when we went through the pillars, it, it, she has told me subsequently it was answered that you answered the question. But I think this is actually a question that's probably on a lot of people's mind, but maybe they just don't want to ask it because it's kind of embarrassing. It, it's kind of like. Listen, I've started a business. It's it's catering. In her case, I'm online only. I don't get any customers. I've tried everything. 
Uh, I know I need patients. I'm doing social media. What else can I do? So it's kind of like I can. I, I know from personal experience that there are uh, a lot of these kind of situations out there. So, again, in you know, in a hundred words or, or less, you know, kind of like uh, just fire away at that one. I mean, I mean, the answer is yes. I mean, you know, one of the the basic questions is, you know, what kind of marketing is effective? And the short answer is, well, it depends on who you're looking for and where they hang out and what they're looking for. So, for example, I mean, if your business is primarily B2C, if you're primarily looking at, at, at consumers, well, you know, a, a, a really killer LinkedIn profile is not going to be too helpful for you. You know, that's more for people in the corporate world, people who are looking to hire corporate executives or professionals. Now, of course, if you're a lawyer, that, you know, and especially if you're a lawyer that's doing, that represents larger businesses, a LinkedIn profile is essential. But if you're, you know, selling cookies or something like that or cupcakes with a local and for a primarily local market, I would say your Facebook or especially your Instagram uh, is, is going to be much more effective. I'm in a business that's not very visual. You know, what I do is kind of, you know, drafting contracts, that's not very visually interesting. A photo of me drafting a contract or a, a photo of my latest SEC filing that's an inch thick is not really going to attract a whole lot of people on Instagram. I mean, it would be kind of like a Zen thing. People would wonder why I'm doing that. You know, obviously, though, if I'm doing cupcakes, if I have a French bakery, what they call a patisserie, Instagram's going to be key to that. I mean, I have to show people what I do, and Instagram is a great place to do that. Uh, so, again, what works all depends on who you're going after, what their fears and passions are, and that really dictates what you do on, on, on social media. That's really, you know, that's the answer. The most effective social media is where is where your customers are and where they're looking for people. Great. That's good. that's exactly what uh, <clears throat> what I would take away from the pillar slides as well. Speaking of the pillar slides, we have a specific request to go back to slide number three, and uh, if we could, if we're going to do that here in a second. And then, if you could just kind of give a fly over that one one more time, Cliff. I think that would do what the uh, what Andrea is asking for. Oh, um, oh the, uh, Andrea is um, pillar slide number three. Oh, I'm sorry. Here, okay, let me go back to that. We kind of, we kind of, we kind of. Oh, there we are. Your public speaking strategy. For if for if your business is in any way information based, if you give advice or counseling of any kind, like I do to my clients. This is the most effective strategy. Uh, people need to see who you are. They need to know that you have empathy. They need to know, and you can talk about that all you want to, but it's, it's a very cheap way for the, and a very low-risk way for them to see who you are. You know, uh, get out there. Uh, to answer the other question, I mean, the, the publication that I mentioned earlier was something called the Fairfield County Business Journal. It only circulates in Fairfield County, Connecticut, so if you're not in this area, you know, it, it, it wouldn't mean anything to you. you know, if you're in California, you're not going to fly to Connecticut to meet with a bunch of local accountants. But I guarantee if in your area where you live, there are organizations, business clubs, organizations, angel groups, venture capital groups that meet on a regular basis, and they advertise their meetings in local publications. Find them. Uh, look, don't be afraid to look for them. Look online. You know, uh, look at look at local organizations. Get your local newspapers because uh, that's where a lot of these people still advertise. Um, you know, are there organizations that meet regularly that talk about the kind of things that you do? And then what you do is you call them. You know, you call them. You, usually, the ads will say, you know, if you want to sign up or if you want to come to the meeting, you know, here's here's Joe Blow. Here's his name and number. Call Joe Blow. Uh, and, and, and say, hey, by the way, just a curiosity, I, I can't make this week's meeting, but just let you know, I'm a local whatever, uh, I, you know, and, I, and just so you know, I have some, some things that I do that I think your, your, your audience is really going to be, uh, be interested in. You know, would you want a free speaker? Uh, but the minute you utter the free word, believe me, you get their attention. Keep in mind who these people are. Um, these are people, they're volunteers, they belong to the organization, there are probably professionals themselves, they don't have the time to do a lot of charity work. What's their biggest challenge every month? They're the program director, their job is to find speakers for the monthly lunch meeting. That's their job, okay? And, it's, it, and they don't have the time to go and really look for people. So when you call them up and say, hey, I'm a local speaker, I'm available to speak and I'm free, believe me, you have their attention. You've marketed very effectively to them. Um, 
Yeah, take a shot at uh, – we we're running out of time here. We've got about one or two minutes. But Jonathan's question about posting articles or posts or writing content for uh, LinkedIn, and then we'll cut it right to the, uh, to the uh, exit. Okay, again, it depends. Is LinkedIn the place where you're going to find customers? That's number one. Assuming that it is, that you're looking to, to deal with corporate people, um, by all means, comment on posts, but – don't do it solely with the with the intent of getting marketing. You know, don't don't post saying, well, you know, you have an interesting problem. This is what I do. Call me. Here's my information. Because very people very rarely do that. Give um, a shot at answering the question, but be very careful how you do it. Uh, I'm, for example, I personally do not do it. I do not post information on LinkedIn because inevitably when somebody posts a question on LinkedIn, there's more to it than what they posted. And if I give too quick an answer, they will take it seriously, they will act on it, and I may be looking at it staring down a malpractice uh, lawsuit because I didn't fully appreciate all the facts and circumstances that that person was talking about. I always tell young lawyers, I do a lot of speaking for bar associations to young lawyers groups, and I tell them there's only one thing dumber than being sued for malpractice by a client, and that's being sued for malpractice for advice that you gave away for nothing and didn't charge for. Uh, so keep in mind that when you are responding to posts, you are acting in a professional capacity. Act professionally and simply say, I don't know all the facts of your situation, but it sounds like you're in this thing, thing, situation. If you are, you know, here's what I can help you with. Uh, I had a client recently in this situation, and here's what happened to them. Never mention names. That's the proper way to deal with, with LinkedIn postings. Make them real. All right, Cliff, great. Thanks. We're right on the 1 o'clock button here, and so we're going we're gonna to shut it down. I do uh, want to thank everybody for attending and remind you that on the 19th we have a webinar, Social Media Advanced Marketing Strategies. Uh, please sign up and uh, t try to attend that. Uh, and also remember that we do offer free individual counseling, so please go to our website understand more about SCORE there, and request a mentor. So on behalf of SCORE, thanks, everybody, for attending. Thanks uh, to Cliff once again for presenting, and everybody have a nice day. Goodbye.